to be talking, uh, unsurprisingly, about uh, big data, does size matter? Can you please put your hands together for Tamandra Harkness? Hello, good afternoon. This is fantastic. You're fantastic. And I have never spoken in a room with so many chandeliers. I'm, I am overwhelmed, QED con. Uh, and so many large cameras in front row. My, look at the size of your lens, sir. No wonder you want to find out if size matters. Uh, so yes, I am obviously here to plug my book, as Matt has kindly already done. He not only gave me a cover quote, he also translated the title into binary for me, so I could print it onto this scarf. Yeah, uh, although I was kind of hand printing it with rubber stamps the night before the book launch, which felt amazingly retro for a binary communication. Uh, so I thought I would treat you to the, the, my first shot of my book, In the Wild. It was literally publication day. I looked in through the doors of a bookshop that was open at seven in the morning, and there it was, sandwiched between Paul Hollywood and Marcus de Sotoy. And in this crowd, I think I can safely say I'm not the only person for whom that is the ultimate fantasy. <laughs> Although, of course, the other thing you can do is you can read it as, Paul Hollywood, does size matter? What we cannot know. <laughs> also, this was June the 2nd. Who would have thought, only a few months later, that the most controversial thing in this picture now would be Paul Hollywood? <laughs> Amazing. So, uh, so yes, there it is. And, uh, and just to further feed my Marcus de Soto fantasies, here I am just on top of him. <laughs> uh, amazingly outselling Marcus de Soto in mathematics audiobooks, uh, he's clearly not put enough puns in his. I think that's the only conclusion. So, you are probably a very data savvy crowd. To be honest, I wrote the book to take you right from what is data. Oh, you surprised me. I thought there'd be some tutting and gasps that I didn't say, what are data? But that's good. <laughs> that's good, so I don't have to justify that. Uh, so it's designed to take you all the way from that, through what people are doing with it, to what I think are the big questions and issues that we need to address. I'll see where I can get in about 40 minutes to have a bit of time for questions. Uh, so to start off, can anyone tell me what this is? It is, it is one thing photographed from two different angles. Any ideas? It's a what? It's a text. It's a text. <laughs> well, it's actually a tally. So, so you are pretty close. If there are any paleontologists or, uh, I don't know, wolf specialists in, I thought somebody might say, I think you'll find that's a wolf shin bone from 30,000 years ago. But I like to think of it as the earliest example of digital data that we still have. About 30,000 years ago, in a cave in the Ice Age, in what is now the Czech Republic, I think we can assume that's not what they called it then, somebody notched 57 notches on this shin bone in groups of five, like you would tally something today. Like I tallied all the cups of tea I drank while I was writing the book. Because, hey, what's data for if not to procrastinate doing actual work? Uh, so, so they kept this tally. Now, I don't know, none, but nobody knows what it was a tally of or even if it was the same person that kept it. I like to think that maybe what was happening is, because it's a wolf bone, maybe this gave me the idea, they're living in this cave, they're out there killing the local wolf pack, there's an argument about who is killing the most wolves, maybe, maybe they're A-B testing the flint arrows against the sharpened wood arrows, and they're, they want to find out which is more effective. Maybe there's two of them rivals going, no, I kill more wolves, I should get to sit near the fire. No, you don't. And they're trying to count them by maybe keeping the skull of every wolf they kill and piling them up on either side of the cave until some third person in the cave goes, look, this is ridiculous. It's a small cave. It's now completely full of wolf skulls. They keep falling over. The dogs are eating them. Can't you find some better way of keeping count? I know, give me one of those bones, I'll make a notch every time you bring one in. Give me another of those bones, I'll make a notch every time you bring one in, then we can just compare the notches. So that was digital data, and it seems really primitive to us. But it will have revolutionized their ability to keep track of information. And something I particularly like, which I suspect some of you will also enjoy, is that if you add up the number of notches, which was 57, uh, you get this in binary, which I gather is just under a byte of data. 
So, uh, so if you wanted to put in a little bit more information to keep track of it in context, you could say that a wolf bone is equivalent to a byte of data. It's, look, I, it's not my decision 30,000 years ago to put 57 notches on, all right? I'm just saying, but it gives me, it does give me pleasure. So, like all self-respecting authors, I thought I should come up with an acronym, or even better, a backronym. You're, you're all, I imagine again, given this crowd, you're all familiar with the idea of a backronym. Yeah, it's, a, it's an acronym that I've reverse engineered to get the phrase big data. Although having said that, I didn't actually bother to deconstruct big because I thought big kind of speaks for itself. So how big is big? Uh, I interviewed a lot of people and I spoke to uh, a neuroscientist in California called John, Professor John D. Van Horn, one of many excellent names of people I've met. And he told me the story about how his first postdoctoral research job, because they were using brain scans. And even in those days, that was a lot of data to scan a human brain. So they sent him out to buy the biggest hard drive they could afford to store all this data they were gonna get coming in. And, and when they got it, people from the other labs would come in to look at this hard drive because they had never seen anything with so much capacity to store data. Because this hard drive they'd been sent out to buy stored four gigabytes of data. And I was, I was interviewing him down the phone and I didn't like to ask him how old he was. Uh, in his photo on the internet, he looks really young. So I don't think this can have been that long ago, but you know, four gigabytes, my phone is eight gigabytes. I don't know about you, I mean, some of you are very techy. You've probably got, I don't know, 10 times that on your phone or, or whatever. But this was it, four gigabytes was a huge amount. Uh, compare that to, and I'm sorry, I apologize for this. This is just a sheer bragging photo. As a, you will, you'll recognize where this is. So it is CERN. They said through gritted teeth. It is CERN. It's actually, what I love is this is one of the two big experiments, CMS, which stands for compact muon solenoid. You think, if this is a compact muon solenoid, I'd like to see you do a big sprawling muon solenoid. So this is, this is huge. Now, the amount of data they get in when they're, when they're crossing the beams, as I like to call it, that's, that's not strictly the technical term, but that is what they're doing. They're crossing beams of protons. Uh, to see what happens when they collide. And each collision is a megabyte of data, and every time they do it, they get 40 million collisions a second. So yes, you may well go Whoo. So, so they're, they're getting 40 million megabytes of data per second. They're getting so much data in, and this was actually, this was a few years ago, so it's probably even more now. Uh, they, they have to junk nearly all of it in order to be able to process it. So. Somebody's job there is basically to run a computer program to decide which data you can get rid of, which data they're not going to need. I think it's called the, the trigger, because <laughs> I suppose they just cull the data like that. Uh, so they, they cull it uh, from 40 million megabytes a second to, I think, 100 megabytes per second. And they still have to have an international grid in order to analyze and process this data. But, you know, it works. They found the Higgs boson, so good for them. So. In a sense, when you say, how big is big data, it's a meaningless question because it's increasing so much all the time that if you take a snapshot of how much is being produced, it's out of date in, in six months. You know the International Scientific Unit of Measurement for Very Large Things is the to the moon and back. Uh, and if you put all the data in the world on CDs, it would stretch to the moon and back you know, 20 times or 100 times or, or whatever it is. But then you think, who puts data on CDs anymore? CDs are too small. They don't hold enough data. It's, it's meaningless. So when you say, how big is it? I like somebody's definition. I can't remember who, which was, it's slightly too big for whatever computer you're trying to analyze it with <laughs> at the time. But it is, I mean, you know, size does matter as far as it goes, but it's not the only thing. So let's go on to uh, what I have actually backronymed, which is the data. And D, I think some of you may be slightly techy crowd, so I'm going to go with my first definition of D, which is dimensions, many dimensions. Now, you can also think of it as different or diverse, but it's basically different data sets of different types of things and with big data, you can actually compare them, put them together. So in fact, 
to go back to brain science, and, uh, and this is an actual picture of my brain from the inside. Uh, and to avoid confusion for whoever it was down here, it's not actual size. <laughs> my real brain is much bigger than that. Thank you, you can come again. Uh, yes, yeah, so go back to brain scans. Now, even when John D. Van Horn started working, they were relatively small compared to what we have now. Now we have functional MRI, uh, so you can measure not only a snapshot of the brain, so this is an MRI scan. Uh, I do actually, I have a 3D printed version of my brain, which again is not actual size, but it's smaller than the real thing, just. Uh, because I have a, a whole scan of the structure of my entire brain, and somebody turned that into 3D printing, and I've now got a little, it's very surreal to look at it and go, that's the bit of me that is thinking, that's the bit of me that is, it's, it's really, I wish I'd brought it now, and I could have, I could have done that kind of thing where I, I appear many times on the screen. Anyway, I digress, I'm afraid I do that a lot. So, brain scans, masses of data in them, and so I spoke to another brain scientist called Professor Paul Matthews in London, and I said, you must be really excited by all this data you're getting in. And he said, to be honest, it's good data, it's interesting, but I'm not that excited about just the brain scans. What I'm excited about is that you can put it with other types of data. And he said to me, that's the difference between big data and large data. He said, you know, in the old days, if I wanted to compare how brain size varies in people, I could get maybe 20 brain scans and, and do a study of that. He said, now we could get 1,000 brain scans and ask it the same question. That's fine. That's large data. That's just more of the same, and we're asking it the same question. Big data means I take those brain scans. I get the medical records of the people whose brains we've scanned. I get the postcodes of those same people. I get the weather records from those postcodes. And I can put them all together, and I can see how those people got different amounts of sunshine, and I can use that to investigate my hypothesis that the amount of sunshine you get affects the amount of vitamin D you get, and that affects the progression of MS, which is uh, multiple sclerosis, which is the thing that he was studying. And that, for him, was big data. It's that ability to put together different dimensions, diverse things. That was what he found exciting. Uh, you know, on a more frivolous level, I could, I could map my cups of tea that I drank while writing the book and compare it to words produced. Come on, we've all done it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's D, that's dimensions or, or different. So what's the A? The A is the first of two A's before I, just, I know what kind of crowd you are. You would sort of people give heckles with footnotes. Uh, so the first A of the two is for automatic. It's the fact that Data is now collected by default. It's easier usually to collect the data than not to collect it. So I'm sure you all know your smartphone is constantly mapping where you are, what you do, what Wi-Fi networks you've interacted with. If you've got one of those health things, it's recording how many steps you take, blah, 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 blah. It does all that by default. You'd have a job to switch it off. Uh, who's, who's got an app called Strava? on their phones. Ooh, quite a few of you. I always like to ask this uh, because, well, Strava is generally used for people who go running or cycling. Which, which one do you do? I use it to follow people who cycle. <laughs> use it to follow people who cycle. This is a whole other thing. <laughs> See, I was going to say, I like to ask this question because then you know, who are the fit people that you shouldn't pick a fight with later? But... Um, well, we've now found the person who follows the fit people. So I don't know what we take from that, but he's here on the second row and he's got glasses and a little beard. Uh, so yes, so Strava works by, you can use your phone or GPS and it will automatically follow where you go and give you, and from that, give you certain other information. So just from that act of automatically tracking you, you then put it up to the, the Strava website, and, and it will show you things like, I mean, this is, I, I feel a bit bad, I've lost the name of the group that does this, but this was a really impressive ride. You see, they, they rode 217 miles in, uh, in, what was it, just over 12 hours. You can see the elevation, so it maps how high up you are. So if you can see along the bottom here, this is, this is an actual elevation graph. <laughs> you see, they set off, they went through Snowdonia Mountains, they're a little bit on the coast, they went through the mountains again, uh, and you can see how many calories they burned by doing it, uh, which is not surprising at all. But, 
because it's doing this automatically, you can actually have some fun. So, uh, so for example, you could go for a run that gives you a picture of someone going for a run, which is a whole new meaning of metadata. Or if you are Murphy Mac and you live in San Francisco and you have your bicycle and your Strava app, you can do this. Isn't that sweet? And I, I don't know how many of you have been to San Francisco. It's really hilly. It looks kind of neat in the square there. There will be a lot of up and downs there. And in fact, you can, if you, if you go to his Strava page, you can see exactly how up and down it is. I mean, I'm sure the scale is different to Snowdonia, but still, that's, that's a lot of effort. They say you should go to a lot of effort to propose. We know exactly how much effort here. Uh, he expended 749 calories. And, uh, and his elevation was 1,371 feet. And adorably, if you look at the comments here, the first comment is Emily McClanahan saying, yes, I love you. You're a hard-hearted lot. <laughs> and the second comment is Murphy M going, yay, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, XOXO, which I don't know is guess young people speak for, oh good, I'm so pleased you're gonna be my wife. Uh, but it's, it's really sweet. So, so you could do that, and you can only do that because Strava automatically collects all this information, and so you can use it to turn it back into a picture with a message saying, marry me, Emily. I see a couple of guys look a bit tense now. They're going, oh, this proposing is going to be more effort than I thought. Murphy Mack has really raised the game here. Curse him. So, uh, so yeah, because it's automatic, you can, do, uh, you can do all sorts of things. Uh, the other aspect of it being automatic is, of course, the Internet of Things, which I'm sure you've heard about before, where objects will automatically collect data and share it via the Internet or wireless or so on. And some aspects of this I approve of very much. I'm looking forward to being able to text my boiler, that is my actual boiler, and, uh, and say to it, heat the house before I come home, which you, know, you can already do through various apps which I'm not organized enough to have. Uh, but the future will be more of objects talking to each other, of course, you see. Well, first of all, they'll talk to us. So my fridge will text me and tell me that I need to, to buy something because it's vanished from the fridge. Uh, or maybe the objects in my house will just start talking to each other. <laughs> Behind my back. But the idea, obviously, the idea is serious. The idea is that, I mean, you know, Mark was talking about renewable energy and the problem being how renewable energy isn't constant. So what do you do when there's not that much energy or you can't store it? And one of the things you do is you collect to a smart grid and then the smart grid says to your washing machine, it's not very windy and it's not very sunny. Can you please not do the washing yet? Because we haven't got very much energy going on. And then, you know, the washing machine will, will say yes. And then, you see where you get heckled by your own household appliances. That's the future, folks. Uh, but, but this is the idea that the, you can harness things not only being collected automatically, but also processed automatically uh, without us having to do anything like our own washing, which is clearly good. So T. Now, T is for time. And part of this is that this data is collected so quickly, so automatically, it's effectively in real time. But this also means that you can use it to project patterns into the future and make a best guess about what the future is going to be. So I am actually going to inflict on you now a, a close, tiny printed uh, spreadsheet of the cups of tea I drank during the first few weeks of writing this book. Uh, as you can see, in order to avoid actually writing, I kept a note of uh, start and end time, so total writing time at the desk, total cups of tea drunk, and words produced with and without footnotes. See, if I was really classy, what would I have done would, would be put a footnote on the column without footnotes, but you know, next time, next time. Uh, this is only up to the start of chapter five. Now, again, I think you're probably, some of you are a very data savvy crowd. Is there anything leaps out at anybody from this, uh, from this data? You know, using the human mind to analyze and draw meaning? I could have aligned my columns a bit better. There's, there goes a designer speaking. Okay, well, well, I'm afraid to me, there's only one thing I'm interested in in this particular spreadsheet, and that is the risibly low number of cups of tea that I was drinking up to this point. Really, you know, it's one, two, the occasional three. 
You may be thinking, that's enough for a day's work. Well, you'd be wrong, not only because nobody can survive on that little tea, but also because I had a bet with the publisher that I would need at least 550 cups of tea to finish this book. And even at a glance, you can see that since I was starting chapter five and had been averaging probably around two cups of tea a day, I was not gonna get there. But thanks to data, you see, I was able to spot this happening. <laughs> analyze the pattern and take action. So I worked out why this was happening. It was happening because my pattern of writing every day was the same. I would, I would make a cup of tea and then I would sit and read what I'd written the day before. And then I'd go away and make another cup of tea while I was thinking about it and bring that back. And then I would basically sit and write the whole time. I was, I was more disciplined than I would have expected, frankly, because I didn't leave the desk until I had written about the amount I was gonna write for the day. So. I was able to take action and think, there is, what can I change here in order to get where I want to be, which is the same amount of writing, but more tea. And what I did, ladies and gentlemen, I bought a tea trolley so that I could make a pot of tea with a jug and a strainer and everything, because we're not savages, and bring it to my office and put it next to my desk. And if we look at the time series for a... Uh, cups of tea drunk over successive days, I think you can spot exactly the point where I bought that tea trolley. And yes, indeed, tea consumption went up from that point. Uh, I, it, because I'm sure some people here love graphs as much as I do. I'm gonna make, take advantage of that and show you a couple more plots here. Now, interestingly, if you plot words produced against cups of tea, it's not, not really much of a pattern there. And this reveals partly, I think, that I'd basically set myself a target of a thousand words a day, so I was going to pretty much write that, uh, except on exceptional days. However, if you plot cups of tea drunk against hours, you do get a bit more of a pattern. So there is some correlation between cups of tea and hours, uh, although, again, you see, this isn't complete information because this doesn't tell you that after draft three, I'd mainly switched from tea to whiskey. When I was writing a book, I can highly recommend this particular type of aptly named whiskey. So, uh, where were we? Oh yes, so that was time. But anyway, so you can use information uh, over time, find patterns and project into the future. Uh, one of the companies I spoke to for this book is called Black Swan, uh, and they do lots of predictive analytics is what they call it, because apparently big data is already out of date. Damn. Uh, and they, they do exactly this. They combine different types of information. So, for example, they work with one of the big supermarkets to predict when is the first big barbecue weekend of the year going to be. Because, you know, there's, there's one weekend where it's a bit sunny and you're thinking, oh, yeah, maybe we should have a barbecue. And you go into the supermarket and it's all burgers and buns and charcoal. And so you do, you have your first barbecue. It's very crucial to them that they get that right because if they get it wrong, they're either gonna be left with loads of perishable food that they don't sell, or you're gonna go and go, I really want a barbecue, they haven't really gotten a thing, they've run out, I'll go to one of their rivals. And so they work with this company, Black Swan, and they use obviously past sales records, obviously weather reports, but they also use things like Twitter and analyzing uh, how many people on Twitter are talking about having friends round or getting at the garden or barbecue weekend, and they use this to predict uh, when the first big barbecue weekend of the year is gonna be. They also do things which might seem more important, like helping any &E departments to predict how many doctors and nurses they're gonna need. And again, they do this by looking at records from past dates, weather forecasts, and how many people are tweeting about going out and getting bladdered, because there is, again, a correlation there. Uh, but they're doing really well. They've only been going about six, seven years, and they've already had to move office, because they're expanding so fast. They've already had to move office nine times, which does suggest to me that maybe they're not that good at predicting <laughs> their own need for office space. But let's not be churlish. Uh, so that's time. So on to the, the second A, which is for AI, or artificial intelligence. Now, now we're gonna have a little interactive point here. So don't go to sleep. Uh, simple question, what is this? Cats, very good. Uh, not somebody in Winchester felt the need to say, uh, a projection to the real world of the platonic ideal of a cat. <laughs> <laughs> How big is it? <laughs> not, not actual size. No, that's Winchester. I'm actually a visiting fellow at Winchester University. I'm a bit scared now. Uh, it's, in fact, I can tell you exactly what cat it is. The cat is called Tilly and it belongs to Laura Ayres. 
because there's no anonymous cat pictures here. I feel that's unethical. And, uh, <laughs> Well, come on, it's very easy to nick people's pictures off the internet. I don't really approve. So we're going to play a little game, which I call Cat or Not Cat. <laughs> Simple binary sorting game, just like you just shout out whether the picture you see is a cat or not a cat. Ready? Yes. Very good. Uh, by the way, if anyone's trying to read the equations, the owner of the cat does work at CERN, so uh, I can't explain them either. OK, onwards. Very good, even though it's inside a bag. Yeah, even though it's disguised on the uh, patterns. Yeah. Yeah, it's good, it will get harder. That exactly, this is my deceased co star, Socrates. Yeah, oh, <laughs> does somebody see my show with Socrates? Somebody at the head? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to break it to you this way. He turned up his little paws last summer. We had a long and happy touring life. He was much more popular than I was, it was annoying. I thought when I traded Matt as a stage partner, Matt Parker, we did a couple of shows together, and then, uh, and then I went up and I did a solo show except for Socrates, thinking, at last, I won't be upstaged by somebody cuter and more furry than me. <laughs> How wrong was I? I should have stuck with Matt. Anyway, uh, he's not a cat, you're quite right. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Language. Sorry. See, I actually, um, so, so the point I'm kind of making here, apart from just checking you're all still awake, is that you had absolutely no trouble there distinguishing between cats and not cats. And indeed, this is the thinking underlying behind. Sometimes, you know, if there's a kind of an internet thing to check you are a person, not a bot, it will say which of these pictures are tigers or lions, for example. A uh, cat's probably getting too easy now. Uh, and you go, this is really easy. But, for a computer, it's really hard, because if I said to you, OK, can you write me a list of rules so I can reliably distinguish a cat from not a cat? It's quite tricky. And if I said, can you write me a list of rules that will reliably distinguish a cat from not a cat to uh, an alien that has never seen a cat without taking DNA from the cat? Uh, it's, it's actually really hard. Although I did say this to a group of lawyers once. I said, could you, you know, write me a list of rules that would distinguish that? And they said, yes, but it would cost you. <laughs> Uh, but, but you can do that really easily, because this is the kind of subtle sorting thing that we can do. Now, how can you do it? It's because when you were a kid, you spent a lot of time pointing to furry things going past, saying, cats! And your parents would either go, yes, very good, or no, that's a dog, or no, that's Socrates the rat, or no, that's Donald Trump's wig. <laughs> I put this example in the book before it looked like Donald Trump was going to be the next president of America. So there goes my next visa. It'll be allowed back in. Uh, so, so you learnt it basically by trial and error. And, and now, if I said, what's the rule by which you know? You go, well, I don't know. I just know. I know when it's a cat, even when it's in a bag. I know when it's not a cat. So what they're doing now with machines is, through machine learning, they're basically using a broadly similar technique. I'm simplifying massively. By showing the machine, for example, 1,000 pictures of cats, 1,000 pictures of not cats, and saying, these are cats, these are not cats. OK, here's another 2,000 pictures. Now, machine, you have a go at sorting them, and we will give you feedback and tell you when you get it right and wrong. And the machine teaches itself to distinguish cat from not cat. And it's not infallible, but they are getting there. And there are some very complex things, like brain scans, where machines are getting quite good at being able to sort them, for example, into male and female brains or psychopath, not psychopath, normal, diseased, that kind of thing. Uh, and this means that not only collecting the data, but also analyzing it and finding patterns in it is increasingly being done by machines, by artificial intelligences. So what I want to do now is, just remind you the, uh, the, the backronym there, so it's Big Dimensions Automatic Time AI. Got that? Also by the book. Uh, what I want to do now is talk about a couple of examples of how big data is used. Uh, and I start off with what I still think is the best one that I found. So I got this email when I was researching this book. I got this email from a guy at the University of Southern California, Riverside, Professor Eamon Koff. And he said, I do this work. Uh, why don't you come down to Southern California, have a look, I'll show you the lab. And, and here's a load of information about it. And I read it and I thought, either this guy is nuts and this is going to be one of those crazy things where you, you fly to a place and you go and look and it's all crazy. And 
well, what's the worst that can happen? I get a day in a sunny part of California. At best, it's going to be amazing. It was amazing. So, uh, obviously not a cat. Uh, anyone, anyone tell me what this is? It is a mosquito. Anyone tell me the species, sex, whether it's had dinner yet? No? Okay. Well, so Professor Eamon Clough, despite being a professor of electrical engineering, he is working on what I like to call bug data because his dream is to treat insects like digital objects. These are his words. Uh, and he, the first way he described it to me was, was he wants to be able to uh, delete insects and forward insects the same way that your, your email can automatically sort out your emails into this is from the boss, this is important, this is spam, I'm going to delete it. Uh, I have to confess, my first thought was, great, you could forward wasps to somebody else's office. <laughs> that was not what he meant at all. Uh, but he has this amazing lab. He has these terrifyingly smart PhD students and postdocs, obviously, working with him. They all, they all go off on their summer break and do you know, holiday jobs at Google and so on. But they come back. Uh, but in his lab, as well as these terrifyingly bright postdocs, he has Lego and soldering irons and electrical components and boxes and boxes of actual mosquitoes, live mosquitoes with, with cloth over them to keep them damp and a big poster of Mosquitoes of the Midwest, which this baby is probably on. And what he's working on is a global database of insects. And he said, well, maybe not all the insects, just the million varieties that are most problematic to us. It's not setting his sights too high, so start small with just a million species. And the reason is, I mean, as, as Mark touched upon in his talk, insects eat a lot of our food. They also spread diseases. I'd like to remind you about Zika virus. There's also malaria, various other nasty diseases. If we could control insects, just the ones that are a problem to us, we could save a lot of lives, as well as helping a lot of farmers in the developing world especially come out of poverty. But we don't want to just kill off all the insects, because that would be really bad for the ecosystem. So his idea is that you have a global database of insects and you can sort the ones you don't want from the ones you do want. Why does he need all this stuff? Lego, incredibly bright postdocs. Post uh, he has a plan. He's building little portable insect traps. Hence the Lego, because you can post them out all over the world. He, he wants schools in Ireland and uh, farmers in Tanzania, anyone in the world, just to get this little parcel, be able to assemble it themselves. The way it works is he's using lasers. He's basically, he's thought, what are all the coolest things in science? I'm going to use them all. So he's got some lasers and he's got some photosensitive diodes, which basically are little electronic components that convert light into electrical signals. So he makes a little light gate using red lasers, because apparently insects can't see them, so they just fly straight through. They don't know they're there. And the interruption of the lasers hitting the photodiodes forms a pattern which comes out as an electrical signal. And what you actually get out is you get the same signal that you would get if you could hear the sound of the insect's wings. Because when you hear the mosquito coming, and uh, perhaps this is the time to tell you, this mosquito was photographed by me on the sheet of the hotel where I was staying when I went to visit Eamon in his lab. Uh, and although it's not actual size, it was huge and it probably had bitten me. Uh, but the sound you can hear when you hear a mosquito coming in is the sound of its wings. It's not, it's not humming to itself. And you can identify most species by the frequency of their wings. So his idea is, well, you could put a microphone in, but they're very sensitive, and then they pick up extraneous background noise. If I capture the insect flying through the gate with these lasers, I get the exact signal of its wings. I can use that to identify not only what species it is, but also whether it's male or female, and even whether it's already sucked blood, because only the females suck blood. And then I've got the insect trapped in this little insect trap box. I can record this data. Some of them are even set up with a little mobile phone chip, so they can send the data straight back to whoever's collecting them. So you could have a worldwide database just constantly collecting information about what species are where, whether they've sucked blood or not, how many of them are. So you could track insect movements and almost in real time because they fly in, you collect the data, it could beam it straight back. 
It's a fantastic advance on what they have at the moment, especially in the developing world. So this is, this is his vision, that you send out these nifty little Lego traps with their little laser light gates. You count what insects are coming in and out. Sometimes you can't tell just from the frequency of the wings, but at that point you want to be able to use things like what time of day it is or where are you, because that will help you distinguish between species. And that's where the big data comes in. Because he's using machine learning to get his computers to say, oh well, based on this signal and this place at this time, this is uh, an Aedes aegypti, for example, it's a female, it's had a blood meal, and it was here at this time. So you're constantly tracking where these insects are. And if that's not uh, an amazing, ambitious project enough for you, he has something else on the go, which I don't have time to go into now, but it also, as well as these other things, it involves DNA sequencing, airships, and drones. So he is basically, he's my poster boy of what you should do with big data. Uh, he's a force of nature. He arrived in America 30 years ago with a bicycle and 200 pounds and not having finished high school. And he's now a professor of electrical engineering building a global database of insects. And what he's using to do that is big data. So that to me is a fantastic example of what we can do and what we should be doing. Uh, a, le a less good example then. Um, this, is a, this is a map of, of Chicago with some different types of data, poverty levels, crime levels, and some people are studying crime using illness as an analogy, so taking an epidemiological approach to crime using big data for that. So, uh, so again, it's the interactive time. Uh, it's probably a bit complicated if you all shout out, but uh, I'd like to think of the answer to this question. How often did you get into fights at school? Actually, maybe we should get people to answer, and then again, we can avoid them like the Fitzstrava people. Now, okay, so how often do you get in fights at school? And how much do you agree with this statement? A hungry person has the right to steal. Now, if you were in America and you'd been arrested, how you answer those questions could make the difference between you going to prison or not going to prison, because they use big data approaches in the justice system in America. Uh, you may have heard, this has been in the news a bit recently, there's one particular algorithm called Compass, which is a proprietary algorithm, so it's written by a private company, but it's used in the American justice system to decide who should go to jail and who shouldn't. And the uh, journalists at ProPublica did a big investigation and came out and said, well, you know, the idea of these algorithms, and I should say, People's motivation for using them is good because they jail too many people in America and they recognize that they jail too many people and they want reasons to keep people out of jail. So what they're actually looking for is they're looking for the people at low risk of reoffending, so they can not jail them. Okay, well, that's, that's a good thing. And they have the idea that, well, you know, the American justice system historically has not done very well by people of colour, has tended to jail a lot more black people than white people. Maybe if you don't leave this decision just to the judges, maybe we'll get something a bit more objective. The ProPublica investigation suggests that they haven't got something more objective, that this algorithm, which doesn't ask about race, nevertheless is much more likely to wrongly predict that a black person will reoffend, and much more likely to wrongly predict that a white person will not reoffend. So that suggests that it's not really working, this whole taking the racist human out of the picture. Uh, but some more recent investigations have suggested that perhaps it's not as racist as their analysis made out. Uh, but you've got to admit that however good your algorithm, if you're working on data from the past, if you're essentially feeding in as your, as your training data sets, you're feeding in what happened in the past, and if in the past black people were more likely to go to jail, it's quite hard to take that out of the algorithm so that it doesn't predict that for the future. Nevertheless, this is, this is one way that they're using big data to extrapolate from things that have in the past been true over a population to make predictions about individuals about the future. And this is where I think it's very problematic because you're making two assumptions. You're assuming that what applies to a population is a good guide to what an individual will do in the future. 
and you're assuming that the future will look like the past. And in some cases, we don't want it to look like the past. Uh, so, so that's another tricky thing. The, the case that particularly made me sit up was one where uh, in West Virginia, uh, this, this system, I don't know if it was the compass algorithm or a different one, but a, a predictive algorithm was used to decide on the sentence of a 19-year-old man who'd had sex with a 14-year-old girl. And it was consensual sex, but you know, she's underage, it was illegal, he admitted to it. So they looked at the algorithm and said, how likely is he to reoffend? Well, based on various things, we're not sure, probably where he lived, his employment status, they decided he should go to jail. And the American Civil Liberties Union got involved. And they said, well, look, if we change one thing here, if we change one input, if we say that he's not 19, but he's 36, then your algorithm says he shouldn't go to jail because he's at low risk of reoffending. Can that be just? Can it be right that a 36-year-old would escape jail for that crime, where a 19-year-old, a fellow teenager, would go to prison? And, uh, and the American Civil Liberties Union put it so well, they put their finger on the problem for me, so I'm gonna use their words. These are sentences divine from nothing more than statistical correlations. Using the same logic, if the Crime Commission discovered that people who like hot dogs and drive Buicks are more likely to recidivate, judges will soon be giving them longer sentences too. Because yes, you can use associations to predict what people are going to do, but that doesn't necessarily mean, I'm sure you of all audiences, I don't have to tell, that correlation is not the same as causation, and it certainly doesn't tell you that one person who shares characteristics with a lot of other people is going to do the same as the majority of those other people. So, so this is the problem that I have with big data, is when it's used to try and predict individual people and when these predictions then go into policy making. I've got to be honest, I'm not that upset about targeted advertising. Uh, when I look at Twitter and for some reason it thinks I want to buy men's razors, and when I look at Facebook and it's offering me lathes, I, I, I don't want men's razors, I don't want lathes, but I'm mildly amused. It's, it's really no skin off my nose, <laughs> unless I misuse the razors, I suppose. Uh, but when I, but when all the lathe, indeed. <laughs> Is this lathe on? Oh, <laughs> that's good, I'm keeping that in. <laughs> but when it affects, uh, and as far as I know, it's, it's not used in the justice system over here, but for example, hiring algorithms, uh, recruitment firms are using software to try and sift through who would be most likely to succeed in a job. And they may do things like, so this is negative filters from, from one such recruiting algorithm. And it's, it's things like where you live and how much time you've had off sick and, and what, what you've been seen doing on, uh, on social media. I mean, okay, fair enough. If I, if I was looking to hire somebody and I saw a flagrant display of weapons on their Facebook page, I admit, I might think twice about that, but yeah, some of these are a bit like saying, do not express any controversial opinions on social media or you won't get a job. And not only that, but you have no way of appealing. There's no, there's no way of redress because these algorithms in many cases are run by machine learning and have taught themselves. Nobody actually knows why they came to the decisions that they came to. Nobody knows what are the exact factors that they've identified and what are the weights they've given them. So it becomes a judge in a black box that is very difficult to appeal against. And that's one thing that I do think we need to keep an eye on. Uh, so I, I suppose I'm quite excited about what we can do with big data, but I do worry that we are losing sight of the fact that you can't capture data on everything. Just to, just to go back for a moment to the bones, the wolf bones. Uh, I, I was thinking about a, a related thing. I really like the, the television programs where they, they dig up human skeletons and the archaeologists come and they go, oh, look, you know, here's this skull from how many years ago. And we can, we can see from examining these bones that this person, whoever they were, uh, where they, they had chronic toothache for 50 years, or we can see that they, they were attacked with a sword and they survived that, but they would have lived with a, an injury to, to their hands and their face for the rest of their lives, or, or we can see that this person lost their nose probably to syphilis, and, or a lathe accident. You see, they're probably not old enough for that, but uh, in the future, that'll be, they dig me up and go, oh yeah, lathe accident, classic. 
<laughs> Should have kept off Twitter and got some work done. And, uh, and you know, I partly like this program because I go, thank heavens I'm alive now in an advanced country with medical care. But at the same time, I go, yes, it's really interesting. It does tell you a certain thing about this person and their life story, but it doesn't tell you the important things because those, those three cases I described could have been Queen Elizabeth I of England or President Andrew Jackson of the US or, or that astronomer whose name I never know how to pronounce, Tycho Brahe? Yes, who was it? Tycho Brahe. Yeah, you knew it from the cephalitic nose, didn't you? He had a golden nose, real character, you should look him up. But, but what was interesting and important about them was not the kind of injuries that's recorded in their bones. And, and any one of you, what is important about you and your life and your experience and the unique universe of which you are the center and that will vanish at the moment of your death is not recorded in your bones. And in the same way, what's important about each of our lives cannot be captured by however many dimensions of data. So that's the side of data that I think we need to take a step back from and say it's useful, but it's not omnipotent. But the other side of data, the, the side that science uses and, and that has enormous potential that we saw at CERN or with Eamon Koff and, uh, and his bug data, I, I think is, is really exciting and has huge potential. Uh, and so I'm going to leave you with another braggy photo, which is me do, doing the virtual fly-through of the nuclear fusion plant that they're building at ITER in France. Because this is where I think, well, you know, fine, smart grids are great, I have absolutely nothing against them, let's by all means be efficient, but if that's the ceiling of your aspiration, that we have a smart grid, we use the same amount of energy or less energy and we move it around and, and maybe we, we get people into the habit of not washing their clothes so much, then you're using big data to make our vision smaller. Whereas if you use it for ambitious projects like a global database of all the evil insects or building a nuclear fusion plant so that everyone in the world can have limitless clean energy, then I think big data can really open the door to some big ideas and you can count me in. I'm sorry to leave you on a downbeat note, but um, I'm afraid my publisher was right. I completed the entire book on only 254 cups of tea. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I did drink half a bottle of really good whiskey. <laughs> Please, ladies and gentlemen, your warmest <laughs> round of applause of the day for Tamandra Harkness. Thank you very much.